Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Chatham House and welcome to this webinar series. It's part of the Business in, in Focus webinar. And today we're going to talk about the future of air travel. My name is Anna Yang. I'm the executive, acting executive director of Hoffman Center for Sustainable Regional Economy here at Chatham House. And so I'll be the chair of this discussion today. And today we have four amazing speakers who will sort of bring us through, guide us through the thinking on the future of air travel. Before I hand over to them, I just want to sort of do a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so today the discussion is on record. So the discussion is being recorded. Um, the way we're going to run this meeting is that we will have, uh, each panelist will have around five minutes. We will then have some time among ourselves so that we can have a conversation. And then we'll open up for Q&A uh, for all the participants of, the, of this webinar. And so with that, um, the, I want to hand over to Gloria. She's the president. Yeah, she is. So that she can start uh, talking about from her perspective. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation uh, to Chatham House for having me he uh, here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to join this um, distinguished panel and to share the view from um, WTTC. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Um, basically, um, WTTC represents the global private sector. Over 200 CEOs around the world are our members. But what's interesting, we represent all the industries from airlines, airports, cruises, tour operators, travel companies. 30% of our members are in Europe, 30% in Asia, 30% in America, and 10% in the rest of the world, and I'm sure that here you see some familiar faces. We do a lot of research in terms of the economic impact of travel and tourism. We have done this for 30 years, and that's how we know that travel and tourism contributes to 10% of the global GDP. If you look at the chart below, you will see that in the last nine years, the growth for travel and tourism has outpaced the growth of the global economy. And last year, these are figures from last year, was not the exception, we grew 40% more than the global GDP. 330 million jobs around the world depend on tourism. That's one out of 10. But I would say the figure that is more important here is that when you look at all the jobs that they were created in the planet last year, in all the industries or all the sectors, one out of four were in travel and tourism. That, that's very important that it speaks about the potential and the significance of this sector in terms of economic impact, the job creation, and of course, the, the social impact. Now, based on our data, we have been um, quantifying the impact of COVID. The first number that we produced, it was 50 million jobs impacted globally. Then unfortunately, that number grew to 75. The last number that we shared was around 100 million jobs globally. That was 1 million pretty much daily. Unfortunately, as we see some measures and, and reopening borders and removing travel barriers, we see that this number can grow if we don't do the right thing, if we don't have a coordinated approach. And this is what we see that the number can pretty much double from 98 or 100 million jobs can grow to 197, depending on how much we delay some of the travel barriers that currently we have in place, such as here in the UK, for instance, the quarantine, the two weeks quarantine, that I'll talk a little bit about uh, that in a minute. So very important to put in perspective the, the impact of the, the jobs. And of course, the GDP, we started with 2.7 um, billion lost, and that number can grow significant as well. Last November, we issued a report of, about crisis. We look at 90 different situations that have impacted travel and tourism in the last almost 20 years. They're interesting when you look at Every single situation, every single shock or crisis impacts our sector, unfortunately. We have always recovered, but it's very important to learn from the past. Here you will see that we have divided this report in four, from natural disasters to political instability, tourism or security, or outbreaks. So we look at 11 outbreaks. Now there are three lessons learned that I wanna bring up because this is very important for the path for recovery and hopefully also the next speakers will talk a little bit about this. The first one is 9-11. Why do we take so long to recover? Why in average in the world, this is an average, it took four years and a half to truly recover. Now, every country was different. This is an average. One of the reasons was the protocols. 
The protocols were implemented without the input from the private sector. And unfortunately, every country had implemented a different protocols for safety and security. That's why almost 19 years later, despite the great work from airports and organizations around the world, we still have different processes in airports to a screening because the governments are requiring different measures. And at the beginning, that created a lot of uncertainty. And that, unfortunately, play against travel and tourism because it took us longer to rebuild the trust from the traveler. We need to rebuild the trust from the traveler because of the fear that we have right now, and that's crucial. So protocols are key. Then we look at 2008. That was another situation that we had. Different crisis, bigger impact. However, we recovered faster. One of the reasons, again, is because we have a coordinated approach. That's when the G20 was created and the ministers of finance worked quite well with the private sector. We knew exactly what was going to happen, and in average, in the world, was 18 months to recover. And then, of course, we have SARS, MERS, and Ebola. Why we were able to travel after these outbreaks without a vaccine? Because we were able to isolate the people infected. Yes, COVID is different. 80% are asymptomatic, but we need to figure out how do we isolate the people infected. So, so there are lessons learned, as you can see here. And that's why in WTTC, we came up with these four principles. We engage with over 180 governments around the world. And every time that we have a chance, we talk to them about these four points. The first one is we need to have a coordinated approach to establish effective operations. Whenever we reopen borders, we need to talk about removing quarantines, for instance. One option that we see is let's, let's build corridors. Let's share experience. Let's see what other countries are doing, like Australia, New Zealand, that built a corridor because they have the medical, tourism, and political component in mind. Then let's make sure that we remove barriers because as long as we have the travel advisors in place and the vans, it's going to be very complicated to uh, recover because, for instance, insurance is a big portion for international travelers that currently we don't have a solution. We're working in WTTC with our members and hopefully will be a solution soon, but that's very important. We need to work together to remove travel barriers and reopen borders if we want to bring back those millions of jobs already impacted. Second is the Laura, semester you have one journey. Minute. Thank you. Second is the semester journey that has to do with experience. There's going to be an experience before the vaccine and another one after the vaccine. Once the vaccine exists, we will have a health stamp that will be included in our reservation. But before the vaccine, we need to isolate the people infected. And that's what we believe that testing contact tracing is key. There are the protocols. The private sector defined these protocols and we are working with governments and the safe travel stamps to identify who has implemented them. And of course, continue with the support, not only having the, the support during the crisis, but also during the recovery, we need to protect the workers and have some investment in promotion. So this is what I have. The safe travel stamp has been adopted by countries around the world and destinations around the world. We have almost 30 countries that have asked for that stamp. And let's keep in mind that originally that was designed for the private sector and for the traveler so that we can uh, rebuild that trust and very much needed to recover. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, so the next panelist is Michael. Please, Michael. Anna, thank you very much and good evening to everybody. Thank you to Chatham House for the opportunity to take part in this. Um, the future of air travel, obviously um, a huge um, a question mark for the um, airline industry at the moment, which has seen such a significant downturn in its history, such a, a crisis on a scale we've probably never seen before. Just before we turn to the future, just looking back, um, the, the, and, I, and I want to really discuss the whole issue of um, the um, aviation industry's environmental impact. Um, we've always had a, an imperative to address our environmental impact um, all the way through our history because um, there is a, a direct link, obviously, between um, fuel burn and CO2 emissions. And um, fuel burn being about one third of an airline's uh, cost base, there is a, an imperative, there's an incentive um, for airlines to reduce um, uh, fuel burn and CO2 emissions to the greatest extent possible. But it's also why we've taken a very proactive and ambitious approach to this topic from an environmental perspective, because we recognized we as an industry want to continue to grow and to develop, but we need to do that whilst taking care of um, our CO2 emissions uh, footprint. And that's why back in 2008, we as an industry sector, and we, we worked with um, airlines, 
with airports, with the air navigation service providers and with most of the manufacturers on an industry-wide set of commitments to reduce our, our CO2 emissions. And that's why we've committed um, to be uh, carbon neutral growth uh, from this year onwards. That's to say, notwithstanding future growth in traffic, we're going to maintain our CO2 emissions levels at today's um, uh, level of emissions. But more importantly, out to 20, looking out to 2050, we're the first industry sector that made a long-term commitment um, to reduce CO2 emissions. And we have committed that our CO2 emissions by 2050 will be 50% of what they were um, back in 2005. That's hugely ambitious. That's going from something like um, uh, just under a million tons of CO2 today, that's going to grow um, probably double by 2050. And we want to bring that back down to around 300 million tons. So just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude. So that's just looking at the past. But now looking to the future of air travel, um, yes, we're in a catastrophic condition at the moment from an industry perspective, but there is going to be a rebound. We believe our industry will bounce back along the little many, taking in mind many of the issues which Gloria just mentioned. But when we do that, I genuinely believe that rebound has to be done in a sustainable way. And I think there's three, three topics around that. We can go into this in a bit of detail. Firstly, it's about better use of our airspace. At the moment, there's a lot of inefficiencies in the way that aircraft are able to fly around the world, around national borders. And we have an opportunity now to take stock of that and to take a more rational approach to how we manage um, uh, airspace. Secondly, it's about um, a genuine energy transition. Today, we're heavily reliant on liquid fuels, but we have the opportunity through government investment, through um, uh, investment into research and development, to move firstly towards electric aircraft, but also, um, just as importantly, um, to transition towards um, liquid fuels, but which come from sustainable sources. And there's a lot of activity on that um, at the moment. It's, there's a genuine uh, opportunity for significant CO2 emissions reductions. And the third area I think we can build rebound sustainably is really uh, having a bit of a better understanding by governments, but also by the flying public, by the general public, of this fundamental role that radiation plays in travel and tourism, but in um, creating jobs and creating GDP. Now, we've begun that conversation over the many years ago. We heard um, in the last 18 months to two years significant concerns from the population in certain regions of the world about whether or not they genuinely felt comfortable um, continuing to fly. Um, they felt that they had to be careful for their individual um, decisions as to whether to, to use air travel. And I think we have an opportunity now, unique opportunity probably, well, unique in our history, to take that conversation up again, to explain to governments, but to explain to our ultimate passengers exactly what we as an industry have committed to do and what we, where we see ourselves um, moving forward in the next decades um, to address those commitments. So I, as I said, I think it's important to take stock of where we are, but it's also very important to look to the future. And we are an industry which has a track record of um, taking commitments and then meeting them. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so next uh, we have John. Thank you very much, John. Hey, well, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and good evening. And I'd echo a lot of the comments that have been made. This is a really existential crisis for many people in the aviation and the wider tourism market. We only make money when people are flying. We have very high fixed cost bases and there will be a lot of companies that go bust during this time. And that's why we have seen so many countries stepping in to support particularly the airlines and in some cases such as the US to support the airports as well. Because I think there's also been an understanding of just how vital aviation is to trade, connecting people, never more so in the, in the uh, crisis period when people rely on aviation to bring in pharmaceuticals and, and medical equipment, but also in the recovery phase when we see so many countries that now rely on tourism and getting their manufacturing sectors back working again, they need aviation as the lifeblood of the global economy to allow that to happen. Um, and so I think, it, I think there is a better understanding in some cases of just how important aviation is. So at the moment, the big focus for all of us is around survival. But there are two further phases. The first around how we get people flying again. And that's about making sure that it is safe and seen to be safe to fly. There's been fantastic developments in common processes within airports and on the aeroplane so that people can be safe and feel safe. Uh, thing, uh, revolutionary things such as UV cleaning um, to, uh, to sanitize 
uh, uh, toilets within an airport, uh, UV uh, uh, handles so that uh, as you push a trolley, uh, you, can, uh, you can remain uh, clean. Um, all of that process will change as you go through the airport journey. But the critical thing, and Gloria has touched on it, is to have a common international standard for health in aviation. So that before you even get on the plane from your point of origin, you know that you're going to be accepted at your destination without the need for quarantine. And here, I think there will be a low, medium and high risk approach to opening up countries again. And this needs to be coordinated on a global basis so that we have the same standards applied in the UK as in the EU, China, India and the US. And for low-risk countries, that would be an air bridge type concept where anyone can travel freely between low-risk countries. For medium-risk countries, there may be a requirement for testing before you fly to confirm that you don't have the disease. And for high-risk countries, there may be a requirement for quarantine or maybe a ban on all flights to avoid the risk of reinfection. But there's that kind of common approach that is needed. And in particular, for uh, where there is testing required, that the tests that take place in the UK will be accepted in Brazil or in Singapore uh, as a common standard. And here we really need global leadership. And I think the role that WTTC has played has been incredibly powerful. But the next step is how we build back better. Um, some of this will be about, um, about uh, the sustainability agenda and in particular, how we can accelerate the move towards uh, low carbon flying. And I'm, I'm on the radical end of the aviation sector where I think that we need to get to net zero carbon in aviation by 2050. You, aviation has to play its part in meeting the commitments of the Paris Agreement if it is to earn its license to operate. And that has to be led out of Northern Europe where there is the most uh, concern about this. And I think this is where we should look to the EU and the UK in particular to set clear targets for the use of sustainable aviation fuels as the only technology that can help us to get to net zero by 2050 and some consistency there that can be adopted in other countries. And then the kind of investment that Michael has talked about in getting the supply side up and running at scale so that the cost of sustainable fuels can come down closer to the cost of fossil fuels. But then I think the other changes that we're going to see will be about the way in which we travel. Far more use of automation, and the kind of uh, journey through, through an airport that we might have seen um, in the movies where uh, facial recognition is your, is your license to fly uh, and we move away from a lot of the traditional manual uh, steps that we've been used to. The technology exists, this will be the catalyst for moving to a new way of traveling. Thank you, John. Uh, the next speaker now we have jean Brice, please. Uh, good evening, everybody. The, um, uh, thank you for inviting me for, for, for to the for the, to the discussion. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm not an English native, so I'm going to be a bit slower than uh, John and Michael have been. Um, it's clearly, and I, I won't repeat it, it's the gravest uh, crisis in our history. It's a matter of survival for many of us, and uh, I mean we we really mean what we say uh, as Airbus, um, and and I think uh, I'll jump on the immediate focus. The immediate focus. Um, was safety. We, we very often in the company life combine health and safety. We talk about the health and safety department and we are learning and paying the high price uh, what it means combining health and safety for our passengers. Uh, we, we commonly take care of the safety of our aircraft, of the safety of our transportation. Uh, we've, we've learned through 9-11 security and now we are on, uh, we are on health uh, and we need to take care of the health of our employees as any employer but we need to take care of the health of our passengers. And uh, from that point, I believe, uh, I think Gloria said it, um, there's a matter of trust. There's a matter of, uh, of a belief that the air transportation is safe. And we have uh, heavily communicated on, the, on something which is a bit counterintuitive, the fact that the aircraft, the, aircraft, the plane, is uh, potentially the safest place from a, from a sanitary standpoint, considering uh, the way it is designed uh, and the fact that there is an environmental control system blowing air from outside, which at 10,000 meters altitude uh, is deemed being clean, uh, and recirculating the air through high efficiency particulate arrestors, uh, which block 99.9% .9 basically of uh, viruses, microbes, pathogens, whatever. So what we're saying here is uh, the air in the cabin being renewed every two to three minutes 
not not moving forward and backward so you are, you have a kind of individual air conditioning uh, is clean enough uh, so that the passengers can feel safe and can feel that the risk of contamination in an aircraft is very low uh, if you add to that the cleaning procedures that are uh, very equivalent to what you find in uh, in the rest of the uh, of the journey uh, you really make people understand uh, that uh, the aircraft is not the issue and then it's a lot about standardization and i think it has been said i don't need to insist we are very we, we we've, we've taken time and effort to be standardized for safety with our regulatory bodies being uh, being aligned uh, having regulations which are recognized across the world and I think we need to, to work hard to have this fast standardization of the health and the sanitary considerations around air travel in the aircraft, but around. And I think it has been made clear uh, by, the, uh, by the others. Now, turning to the green aviation, and we, we, uh, we're in the present, what do we, uh, what do we mean for the future? You, it has been said, uh, we, we are facing these challenges, the uh, attack targets that Michael has uh, evoked, minus 50% in 2050. Uh, to reach these uh, net zero emission, at a point in time, we must, we must bring to the market a green aircraft. So that, that's our challenge. Um, it's potentially a long-term one, and I will come from the long-term to the short-term. Uh, the green aircraft will only come through uh, technology disruptions. So we, we, we need to think bold. Uh, we need to be disruptive. Uh, we've talked a lot about hydrogen, which is one of the liquid fuels uh, which naturally emits less CO2, hydrogen and oxygen makes uh, water and energy. Uh, now it has to be cold. It's, uh, the volume is much higher than the one of kerosene, so it's not a given. Um, but that's really uh, something we are, we are aiming at, among others. And we welcome the announcement last week by the Transport Secretary uh, that the government, the UK government, will set up a, a Jet Zero Council, and we hope to be uh, actively involved in those discussions. Now, uh, to start from the long term to the, to the short term, uh, we need to work on R&T with, uh, with ATI, with, uh, with, with the government. That's very clear. We have this, uh, we have this duty, and uh, we are discussing at the moment with them, with, with BASE, how to uh, boost the R&T funding uh, to, get, uh, to get the UK uh, part of what we name the Airbus Club, uh, which goes beyond the uh, Europe-UK story, uh, the, the club of uh, the four Airbus countries. We need to work on SAFs, on sustainable uh, aviation fuels, and, and you both, Michael and John, have said it. Um, that's the policy. It needs to be promoted. It needs to be affordable. So there needs, there needs to be a bulk of, uh, of money and, and uh, energy spent on that. And uh, last, or first, but not least, green stimulus, things that we see in Europe. Um, cash for scrap could be a name. Uh, our old aircraft, and there are many old aircraft flying over our countries, uh, consume 25-30% more fuel than the, the latest generation. And just changing aircraft and having incentives for the airlines uh, to, to change aircraft is again is a step is a step gain uh, that we can uh, cash in from now on uh, from a, an energy and a CO2 standpoint. So, I to conclude, I said that it's it's our gravest crisis, but in a, in a, in a country that uh, that you know that. that uh, uh, that uh, Anna knows well, uh, crisis is, uh, is made of two symbols, uh, and the second one is opportunity. So we want to make an opportunity as of this crisis. It will take time to recover. Depending on the industry, it, will, it could be long. For us, the long-range segment may take five to six years to recover its uh, 2019 level. Uh, but we have to show that we learn from, uh, from all of this, and I think to conclude on what Gloria started with, uh, we have to show our resilience and our ability to learn from, uh, from this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, well, thank you for to all the panelists. Just before we start our conversation among ourselves, um, just to remind uh, the participants that you can submit your questions in the Q&A function. And so I will, once we have, um, I will sort of open up for it for in, in five minutes. So before we open up for this conversation with the participants, I wonder whether the panelists whether you have questions for each other in terms of, you know, this is a very unique setting of having the four of you bringing different perspectives on the macro to sort of an, uh, and also from a specific industry actor uh, perspective. What would be, you know, what would you like to ask each other? 
let me ask if I may, um, the, the question about uh, accelerating the, the agenda during situations like we're living, of course, there are opportunities because of the disruption and technologies, but there are also some ag agendas that are accelerating. One of those is biometrics or using the technology for a seamless experience. In WTTC, we have been pushing for that agenda for the last two years because we believe it, it's easier, it's better, it increase security, increase uh, a lot of benefits. And now, of course, uh, with COVID, it's touchless and it has a lot of benefits. So I would like to ask um, the, the other participants, what do they think? We believe from WTTC that the countries who have implemented biometrics, they might have an advantage to recover faster. And, and the ones that they are behind, they need to catch up pretty soon. But I was just wondering, uh, what, what is their view? And in this case, we believe also that the consumer point of view is going to be driving more biometrics because it's touchless, it's more secure than before. Perhaps there were more concerns. If I could pick that Please. up, perhaps. Um, I think you're absolutely right that um, this could be the catalyst for moving more to a biometric end-to-end -end passenger journey. And, uh, uh, and the technology has been there for some time. What we've been lacking is the political will to make it happen. And very often that comes down to very practical issues that one part of the journey might be the responsibility of the Homeland Security Department, another part might be uh, in, in another part of government. And they've not really been joined up in, enough around a common agenda. And, uh, and this, is, this could change um, with this crisis. And there are some natural challenges with this, that if facial recognition becomes the, the norm, can you, can you maintain facial recognition when people are wearing face coverings? Uh, yeah. Really practical questions like that. And, but I think, I think this is the time to really push for this and make it part of the common international standard for, uh, for uh, travel, because there needs to be a, a common approach between the UK, EU and the US uh, to really make this uh, a global system. But I think we also need to, to recognize that um, we, we can't become entirely dependent upon the automated version. We need to be able to default back to a manual process, which may feel redundant. But what we've also seen during this crisis is that um, some control authorities have reimposed the, uh, uh, the old manual way of doing things. And one, one practical example, uh, the UK border force uh, e-gate process is one of the is really a world-class arrival experience which increasing numbers of nationalities can use but during the quarantine process they have switched off the e-gates because they want to do a manual check of every single passenger arriving um, so they've reverted to the old way of working it's incredibly inefficient but you can understand from a government point of view why it is important for them to do that and uh, and so I, I think we will have to maintain a dual capability for the foreseeable future to deal with the shocks that come our way. Wow, that's really interesting. Uh, anybody else want to sort of take Gloria's question, Michael? Uh, I, I'd like to take that in just in a slightly different in a slightly different way. I think I think the issue of biometrics and the whole passenger experience is really fundamental um, at the moment, and clearly a big part of our. Um, Reach demand, uh, demand restart, getting people back on aircraft is all about passenger confidence. Huh? Um, what I'd like to just shift it somewhat to, to also um, bring it back to the whole environmental um, area, which is to say, I think um, today passengers will be asking themselves these questions around, is it safe to travel? Um, am I going to find myself stranded? But I think the third question is going to be, um, what's my environmental impact? You know, we've all heard from family and friends over the last um, months as um, our world has gradually seemed to shrink. We've all heard, um, isn't it great because there isn't any carbon emissions? Um, and, and so I think there's going to be a, a, a question mark in a lot of people's mind to say, okay, I really want to um, get back out into the wide world, but um, is my individual decision going to have an impact on the environment? And that to me is also part of the passenger confidence uh, question. Of course, as, you know, as I said, and as we've heard from, from the others, we put in place something pretty ambitious to, um, to, to address our environmental impact. We need to continue on that journey. Um, uh, and, and this is a good, uh, a unique point in time to get governments on board with that. That is, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, my mind's stuck if I'm thinking about like how, how, you know, so almost this sort of shift in norms in terms of what people expect 
but then also their sort of how their personal decisions um, are yeah, very, very interesting. Um, before I open for the, the wider audience, does anybody else want uh, have another question? I had a question for Gloria. Um, Gloria, you've Perfect. done some incredible work uh, to get some common standards and common way of communicating to passengers and things like the safe travel which, uh, with, with a, a kind of kite mark uh, for giving reassurance all the way through the journey. And uh, Jean Gris touched on this earlier, having consistency throughout the journey and including at the, uh, at the destination is so important to building confidence. And I just wonder um, whether you have, a, have any thoughts about how there can be a, uh, some kind of quality measure sitting behind the use of that standard so that people know that um, uh, they are certified that there will be a certain level of hygiene standards in place if they see the green mark that WTTC has developed. And yet, uh, the, the, um, it's not a certification and, and the goal of our protocols it was just to create this standard so that we can have, we can have the same experience. For instance, we started with hospitality and based on the knowledge of the hotels offering the rooms to doctors and nurses, that's what we included with the protocols, of course, with WHO, CDC and all the experts involved. In the case of aviation, it was IATA, ACI and ICAO, the ICAO guidelines that we use, which are the best and that's what we use. For, for the standards. And then when the TripAdvisor, Expedia, and our members say, okay, how the consumer is gonna identify, that's how we came up with the stamp. Now, the interesting situation is that the countries are asking us now for the stamp. That was not planned for, but I have to say, it has been very interesting that the country is asking they can use the stamp. And that has helped us to request them to implement the guidelines from ICAO, our protocols, and the countries now are sharing the stamp with the local private sector and they are helping us auditing that experience and of course here if the consumer finds a different experience TripAdvisor they can report that to other means at the end of the day the goal that we have let's keep in mind is to rebuild the trust from the traveler that's what we need to figure out how do we get there what path we need to follow to get there and how do we do that sooner so that we can have all, all those millions of jobs impacted and we can recover uh, the sector. But we don't audit. Our members, of course, they are responsible for implementing the protocols, but the countries are helping us now. As we have, as I say, 38 countries and destinations endorsing and implementing the stamp and 90 more in the pipeline. Um, I thought when we were just, you know, uh, jean please you had a question that you posed to us well, to your fellow panelists. Would you care to share that? Because I thought that that was a really interesting question that kind of got my mind thinking. I was really curious to hear um, the, the rest of the panel's view. You mean the one, uh, what's going to be different The future, yeah. yeah. I think, I think yeah, we, we, we've pivoted from, uh, from the crisis we're in to, um, to a sustainable future. Uh, and maybe we touched one example with the exchange we just heard between John and Gloria. Uh, what, I mean, we, some things turn different after 9-11 uh, in air transportation. What's going to be different for us? Uh, what's going to be, definitely, we know it's going to be different for us as an industry, as a large industry, uh, the four of us representing this large industry. Well, if I can, if I can start, I think that um, one of the, the big things that came out of 9-11 and previous security crises was that security became the, one of the key focal points in uh, the uh, air travel journey in the way it hadn't really uh, before. It had been very light touch before. I think we're going to see the same thing happening with health, um, either at the airport or before the airport, certainly for a period of time. And over time, that the, we will find a, a more elegant way of screening people for uh, COVID and, and other, uh, other potential um, uh, diseases. And that will just get built into the passenger journey so that maybe in 10 or 15 years time, we don't even notice it in the way that if you were to fly through a, an airport in China, you're being health screened and that they, they build a massive amount of space into the terminals for the health screening. But for the most part, you just don't notice that part of the process because you, it, it is just so standardized now. Um, and I think, I think that, will, that will shift. Um, but just as we had we, after 2006 and 9-11, um, it will take a little while for that to settle down and for the next 18, 24 months, it will probably feel a little bit clunky and a little bit um, inconsistent between, uh, between 
airports, airlines, uh, and destinations. And I think the, the more that we can do to standardize and deliver real consistency and signal that consistency using things like the, the WTTC mark, the better to just provide reassurance to people. Thank you. Uh, Michael Goya, did you? Kind of well, I, I fully support what John say, 100%. I couldn't agree more. Actually, when you look back on the, the crisis that we analyzed from the past, the countries had the outbreaks in Asia. They implemented some measures that they still today use. And this part of the world, we haven't seen those type of outbreaks. And of course, now that this is global, it's gonna change exactly as, as, as John mentioned. And the other thing is that we need to learn also to prevent, to have a similar situation in the future. We knew that something like this was gonna happen, to tell you the truth. Four years ago, we have been talking about preparedness, preparedness, but unfortunately, we were not ready. No one was ready. and and. What's a little bit sad is the lack of coordination also among countries and, and leaders because they are not sharing best experiences. We talked to South Korea, Singapore, and Iceland, even so close. They have been very successful without even a lockdown, right? And one of the issues that we see is even the testing component. Everyone had to develop their own testing instead of using someone else's test. So we are learning a lot through the process, but as John say and, and the others agree, the experience is going to change, it's going to be fine-tuned, it's going to be better, but that's going to take some time. Meanwhile, our efforts should be in there restoring the, the confidence of the traveler. And in that case, I will ask um, Jan Brice from Airbus, I think it's safer to be in a plane, from my view, than sometimes being in a cinema, right? Where you have so people so crowded and all of that. And I think that we need to communicate more of that. And that's what we are going to try to put a campaign where we share all the... Um, technical aspects of being in an airport or in a plane where you have less chances and less risk, as long as you have the protocols in place and, and of course you follow the guidelines than being in an indoor place, uh, watching a movie or something like that. Ready, ready to share uh, any elements helping you to communicate. And we, we have them all. Uh, and at the moment we are telling uh, that the risk of uh, contamination is very, very low, much lower than in many other areas. I usually compare it to my office. I say it's much lower than in my office. Um, and uh, I think we're ready, yeah, ready to share a lot. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's not arrogant, it's just a fact. Huh? A, a, a metallic or composite tube that flies at um, uh, 36,000 feet in a, in a hostile environment has been designed to keep the air at the right temperature, pressure and cleanliness including uh, viruses and, and pathogens. Well, that's what it is. So we are not, uh, we are not just over-advertising, we're just telling what we had to design uh, by nature. And SARS has uh, helped us to, to be uh, more rigorous in the way we, um, we worked on the, on the health front. So on the point, and we have a question from the participants, um, on, from the point of lessons learned, and everybody, I mean, whether you believe that there's maybe a second wave or not, I think the question that we have, there's a question here, it's like, what lessons have we learned from the economic lockdown, you know, that make sure that when we have a second wave moving forward, how can we respond to it? I, maybe I could start. Um, I believe we have that, uh, is that uh, uh, we do hope I mean, uh, it, it's at least it's a hope. Uh, hope it's more uh, than all together. That all together we are learning. Uh, we've got a shock. We didn't know anything about this virus. Um, even the smear con is, is a smear contamination a real one, or is it only by um, by, by uh, vaporizing in the air? Um, we know more now. We know more about the way uh, the way it's, uh, it's contagious. Uh, we know more about the efficiency of the measures. We know more about what works, what doesn't work. I mean, there were polemics about schools, the kids, the, uh, and, and the, 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 the hope, which has to turn to a belief, is that uh, altogether driven by, uh, by our, our political power, uh, we would have an adapted response to a further outbreak and to rebound. It will not be global, it will be local. So uh, closing, I mean, these famous safe corridors, closing borders, um, having stricter controls in some, in some, uh, on some transportations, uh, having local lockdown uh, should be a way, once we detect better, we test better, we, people all around the world, including in the dirty Europe, know that we have to wear masks. I mean, all of this together, I think, should make us more responsible in, in uh, replying to, a, uh, to such, a, uh, to such a foreseeable uh, rebound of the, uh, of the, of the pandemic. Now, is it just hope? Uh, 
I, I'm personally and I'm professionally behaving that way. Now it's a, uh, it has to be collective. I have, Michael, you have unmuted. Did you want to say something or? Um, I mean, just on that lessons learned, I mean, one positive lesson learned from this is um, the extraordinarily rapid way in which um, aviation has responded in terms of putting in place the restart plan. And that includes all of the organizations on, on, on this panel, as well as many, many others, and our international regulator. And, and I think we're probably um, one of the industries which is um, most prepared for, for our rebound when you compare it with other sectors of the, um, of the economy. We know what needs to be done, and, and, um, and, and Gloria, John, and Reece, Jean Brice have talked through that. So um, it's, it's actually a very positive lesson learned, which is we as an aviation and travel and tourism community um, responded very quickly, were, had the relationships where we could work together to get all this uh, in place. Thank you. Um, so I'm sort of worried. We still have a couple of like four or five minutes ahead of, us, ahead of us. There's a really, really interesting big or small question, depending on how you take it, which is, you know, you, you all talk about like this is a survival issue. Like how do we recover? How do we bring sort of build public trust and also in a way like the word of legit legitimacy. So, you know, if there's a question here is that if you realistically want to become environmentally legitimate and then bring back the people to the trust, do you think it's inevitable that future flying will be the end of cheap uh, travel, cheap airline travels? And that in a way, you know, if we bring it into a, people asking themselves about fast fashion as well. Put that. Well, if, if I could start that, um, I hope not. I mean, cheap, cheap travel has been a great economic um, and social benefit for people. And uh, I think it would be a real disappointment if aviation became the preserve of the rich in the way it was 30 or 40 years. We, my, my family couldn't afford to fly anywhere. I didn't get on a plane until I was 21 and, and being paid for by the company. And that's the way it was back then. We don't want to go back there. The real issue is not aviation, it is carbon. If we can tackle the carbon issue and focus all of our energies on decarbonizing flight in the way that Michael and Jean Gris have so beautifully described, then we can protect the benefits of aviation in a world without carbon. And I think one thing that we have seen through the, uh, through the COVID crisis is uh, what happens in a global economy when the planes stop and trade stops and co connectivity stops and people can't get the, uh, the essential uh, 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 goods that they need for everyday life, for their just-in-time supply chains. We need the, our children's generation to be able to maintain, continue to get those benefits. And that's why it's our responsibility before 2050 to get carbon out of aviation. We, uh, it is not enough just to halve the level of carbon, even though that is a uh, a great consensus to have got to globally. Uh, we have got to get to net zero emissions by 2050. Very cool. Um, Gloria, jean yes. I think in a way. Yes, Let me com ahead. come in on that, if I may. I fully agree with that. There's a lot of work being done also that we need to replicate. I am aware about airports having initiatives and being carbon neutral or, or towards that goal and, and carbon is, is the goal. But let's also put things in context, right? The travel, uh, I mean, and, and aviation in this case, which is the backbone of travel, travel allows to a better share of income, right? Travel has a significant social impact around the world. You cannot imagine the amount of countries that the GDP, more than half, depends of the travel industry. So that's put on the table, that reducing poverty. So it's significant, the, the social impact. And if we, we are seeing that right now, the levels of poverty are increasing. The, I mean, it's, it's devastating, especially in developing countries. And, and even in countries that they need travel to protect wildlife, like in Africa, for instance, for the parks and aquariums and so many places around the world. The only benefit that I have seen from this situation is to put things in context and have a better understanding about the contribution of, of travel and, and tourism around the world, I would say. It's not only looking from one angle, but we should look at it from the whole impact. Thank you, Gloria. Michael, you look like you're going to say something. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the word credibility um, in, in, your, in your question. And I think um, to establish our credibility, you just need to look at um, the journey that we've come on in our um, uh, addressing our CO2 impact. Um, since 1990, we've reduced per passenger 
emissions by 50% compared with what they were. What that means is, if we were able to take a flight tomorrow, um, it would produce 50% less CO2 than the same flight would have produced um, just, uh, just 30 years ago. That's a huge um, uh, step forward. Now, of course, it's not enough. We can continue um, to have this license to grow um, and not um, make even further reductions. But, you know, remember where we've come from. We were also the first sector which was able to bring together um, all parts of, of the industry, as well as governments from um, every region of the world to, um, uh, to um, convene around an international agreement on uh, carbon offsetting. That had never been done before in any other sector. We're in the implementation phase of that, and you'll see um, the results of that in the years to come. Um, but that's just another step on this journey towards this long-term objective. And we all have to up our levels of ambition, but, um, but I don't think we're an industry which takes this thing lightly. Um, we're an industry that's um, been working on this over a number of years. And, and as I say, our credibility speaks for itself. We've come a long way um, in, in this. And these are very serious commitments that um, companies like Heathrow, like Airbus, and many, many others have taken. Thank you, Michael. I know, Jean, please, you have raised your hand as well. Yeah, a compliment to what Michael just said. Uh, it will happen. I mean, we, we, we can be uh, reasonably proud of what we've done. Uh, this further change will happen. Uh, I will give you just uh, one reason and then a bit of an excuse. So the reason is uh, today we have difficulties to hire uh, young engineers if we don't commit to them mm. on, our, on our ambition. I mean, they ask us. It's a reverse interview when you, when you hire a guy now. So we, we are entering in a crisis. It might be slightly different, but not to that point. Uh, it has even exacerbated the, um, the environmental appetite of the, the younger generation. And it's, it's amazing to, to see it. And they join us, and the ones who join us now are, are telling us what we have to do. So uh, it's good news. Uh, and yeah, we, we've got uh, young engineers. I mean, uh, uh, I should uh, normally hire something like 500 a year uh, to be at the moment, but uh, it, it's, it's uh, super, super good news, in, uh, in my opinion. And now, a bit of the excuse. Uh, we are, uh, we uh, aerospace, we commercial aviation are an easy target. And, we, and, and let's, let's uh, when we start by that, we, we are shut up. But I think we've, we've, what we've talked about in the last uh, 45 minutes, uh, we might be credible. Uh, we are 2.5% of the world CO2 emissions. For a duty uh, that Gloria has explained, for a duty which is to connect people, to bring peace, to, ha to help people to, to know each other. Uh, okay, there are uh, questionable uh, ways to travel, I agree, uh, but the day aviation is down because uh, it has been the easiest, shortest term target, we've solved two and a half percent of the problem. And, and aviation has shown by the commitments, and, and I'm back to what Michael said, we've shown by the commitments we've taken, we've shown by our, our track record that we are caring for it. And then we, need, we must tell everybody transparently what the, the, the carbon footprint of their travel is, but we must do it also in a train, taking into account all the construction work. I mean, it has to be done across the board. Uh, we, we, I think we, we are a bit too easily pointed out. That's not a way for us to escape the change, to escape uh, our challenges uh, and our duty to reduce it. We've taken this commitment, so it's there, and, and we are on it. Uh, but let's put things in perspective in a way. Yeah, well, Jean-Pierre, that is a very, very poignant point. I mean, this is a very, very interesting conversation. And obviously, you know, before something that we said is in a way, you know, there's a, a bigger underlying conversation that you just raised towards the end about talent attraction and what is the purpose of business and responsible business, which is actually is an ongoing sort of research program that Chatham House has across the house. So, you know, this whole norm shift, value shift is something really, really interesting. And we're just in the middle of it. And then all these shocks, just like these surf, they surface all these deeper underlying issues that it's been bubbling on the background. So what I would like to do is to thank you enormously for your time, for your insight, and for the willingness to open to sort of share this discussion. And before I wrap up, two things. One is that um, the Chatham House team will send a survey out to the participants and also the panelists so that you can give us feedback so that we make sure that we deliver the best experience uh, and webinars uh, for everybody. And I want to plug a meeting that we're putting together for July the 15th. So that's a Hoffman Center, uh, the, the center that I work in, uh, called Reinventing Meetings. 
So it is about to think like, how do we, you know, some of the issues about what, what does the future of meeting look like? So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for your time and thank you. Please join us um, for a future discussion as well. And have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.